I have often walked on wooded trails in Massachusetts and marveled at the pioneers who built them. But this summer, while I watched a play called Listen to Sipu, my mind was blown to learn that in 1675, local Native Americans were shackled and carted down wooded trails to Watertown, Massachusetts, where they were boated to a concentration camp on Deer Island. Men, women, and children forced to winter in the Boston Harbor cold. I had not absorbed that Native Americans were living near the Puritan settlement, where I am now a member of the first parish of Watertown. I could recite nothing about local Native history beyond the story of Thanksgiving in Plymouth. I decided to learn and share what I could about ties between Native tribes and my communities. Before the Puritans settled in 1630, Watertown was called Pequoset, and nearer where I live in Waltham was called Nonantum. I have family ancestors who settled in nearby places originally called Wokahamet, now Dover, New Hampshire, Winnesquam, now Newburyport, and Missuckatucket, now Marshfield. I was born in the homeland of the Pequot and grew up in a Connecticut town along the river that was called Pequot, but is now called the Thames. State archaeology reports find that Algonquin-speaking people first began settling in New England at least 9,000 years ago. They migrated north from the Lenni Lenape tribes based in the Delaware River Valley woodlands. To put it in perspective, that predates the pyramids of Egypt and Stonehenge by nearly 5,000 years. Artifacts found in this area of Watertown are from the Orient Susquehanna and Wayland projectile styles. All of these types have also been found in locations south and west of New England, indicating travel and common ties in these periods. The regular travel around New England for thousands of years is obvious proof that the well-established trails that I hike and the trails upon which so many of our roads have been built were trod and developed by Algonquin and Iroquois-speaking tribes, eons before any Europeans bravely ventured into the wilderness. If you walk these ancient trails, mindful of the complexities of other known ancient cultures, you can begin to open your eyes to the mysteries that remain, the well-marked trails and gathering places, the sacred images and astrological viewpoints. These were communities steeped in tradition, common culture, acquired knowledge, and organized governments. Hello, everybody. How are you doing tonight? Well, awesome. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Farris Gray. I am the Sagamore of the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkabog. It's an honor to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, the word Massachusetts, for us, it means many from the hills. Um, we say the hills, we're talking about the Blue Hills, which is um, it's a pretty big um, range uh, around here on the coastline. But when you stand on top of the Blue Hills, you can see far. Um, this is a place that was great importance to us. Um, it was the highest feature around, and um, the southern Massachusetts would um, would communicate through signals with the northern Massachusetts through this hill. Um, the Massachusetts tribal nation before before the first plagues landed on our shores numbered the tens of thousands from the southern New Hampshire, Nani Peshmer's territory, the northern Massachusetts to southern Massachusetts. Chickatawba's Terry, the southern Massachusetts. The Massachusetts Sockums, chiefs, were all related, descendants from the same common ancestors. Captain John Smith, who explored the coast from Ponotscot to Cape Cod in 1614, of all these places Smith visited, 
in New England, as he called these lands, he found nowhere more favored than the country of the Massachusetts, which is the paradise of all these parts. The seacoast shows you along large cornfields with great troops of well-proportioned people. Now, uh, to us, this is huge um, to learn these things, um, to know that as um, these European explorers are coming here that they call our territory the paradise of all these parts. Um, it's just a wonder wh what it looked like, like this area, what it looked like. It must have been beautiful. Absolutely, because um, John Smith, he's a well-traveled man. He went in a lot of places, and they call the Massachusetts country the paradise of all these parts. The Massachusetts were not simple farmers. We were a master ar agriculturalist. From maize, squash, and beans to nuts, berries, grapes, and surprisingly wild rice, our planted fields were vast, and we spent most of our time during the growing season tending to our fields. The French explorer Samuel de Champlain wrote, the Massachusetts were too preoccupied with fishing and farming to devote much time to hunting and trapping furs. The French colonies were to be financed via the fur trade. This is the reason the French did not settle Massachusetts territory, because we were farmers. But, but back then, um, the French, they were traveling the coast before the English were. And the English were, but mainly fishermen. Trading had been well established centuries before French fur traders discovered the riches of the East Atlantic coastline in the 1500s. They found mutual trading partners among the First Nations and found much to be admired in native community systems and skills. In 1580, there were at least 350 English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese cod fishing ships documented near Newfoundland. By 1600, the Dutch had joined in trading partnerships with inland Mohawk and Mohegan people, and the lucrative maritime cod fishing had migrated south to Nova Scotia and the islands off the coast of Maine. In this pre-colonial time, there was much knowledge exchanged between cultures. There is also documentation of enslavement of natives by Europeans and the exchange of deadly disease. From 1616 to 1619, the plagues nearly wiped out the Massachusetts. From northern Massachusetts to southern Massachusetts, there was death. 90% of our population was killed. To put that into perspective, let's say there were 30,000 Massachusetts. That would mean 27,000 were killed. Whole villages lay dead, with none remained to bury their dead. 3,000 remained to tend to the planted fields, even fewer to defend our resources against rival tribes. Whether the plagues were introduced by accident or a calculated campaign, the result was the same. The Europeans had introduced us to hell. Now, it's exactly what it was if you was a native back then. Um, I mean, if you think about it, if all of a sudden all of us started getting sick, your family started getting sick and the plagues, you know, just think how traumatizing, how scary that would be. And no one had an answer to what it was, just people were dying. And so that had to be devastating not to know what it was. I know up north, uh, and the, the Penobscot said that since the French started coming, all their people were dying, so they wanted the French to leave. There are many debates written on reasons for the mass death among the Massachusetts, with leading causes being smallpox spread by contact with sailors and traders along the coast, and or the rat-borne leptospirosis spread from the many ships dumping wastes, which contaminated water sources and soil used for native food storage. Regardless, it is clear that the native people living along the coast of Massachusetts and Maine were especially impacted, while those further inland were not. By the 1600s, the papal doctrines of discovery had long been used to justify the European thirst for land expansion, slave labor, and the colonizing profit of resource theft from non-Christian nations. Christopher Columbus is well documented for his mass enslavement, cruelty, and murder of indigenous in the Dominican Republic in search of non-existent gold. King James of England saw the reported deaths of the Massachusetts people as a sign from God that the time was ripe to strike a claim in New England. Within these late years, 
there hath by god's visitation reigned a wonderful plague the utter destruction devastation and depopulation of that whole territory so as there is not left any that do claim or challenge any kind of interest wherein we are persuaded that those large and goodly territories deserted as it were by their natural inhabitants should be possessed and enjoyed by such of our subjects king james the first when the pilgrims arrived in plymouth in december 1620 they discovered that native people had not been fully decimated as promised while they struggled to build both housing and fortifications in their first two months nearly half of the mayflower passengers died in the winter cold they had skirmishes with natives and appointed miles standish as commanding officer but that march the settlers were helped by the abenaki sagamore named samoset having learned some english from fishermen and trappers in maine he explained the epidemic deaths of the village of patuxet told them about tisquantum the sole remaining villager who spoke english well because he had formerly been enslaved in england tisquantum helped the plymouth settlers arrange a meeting with the wampanoag sachem named massasoit whose tribe had suffered greatly in the plagues massasoit at the request of the english signed a peace treaty pledging mutual defense against outside attacks and weaponless trading with the plymouth settlers in 1622 edward winslow provided aid to massasoit when he became ill and the loyalty of the wampanoag was further secured in 1623 Massasoit warned Edward Winslow about a possible attack from the Neponset band of the Massachusetts people, whose sachem was Chickatabit. Chickatabit controlled a wide area between Dorchester, through the Blue Hills, and south to Plymouth. Many of his people had also died from disease, and it is not known if Massasoit's warning was valid or a power play by the Wampanoag sachem. Regardless, the Plymouth response was to send in Miles Standish, who arranged a peace talk with Chickatabit's warriors, but then ambushed and killed them, along with several vi villagers in Wiscusset, now Weymouth. He posted one of the warriors' heads on a spike at Plymouth as a warning. This attack led to distrust of the English by many tribes, contributed to Plymouth's demise as a settlement, and eventually led to the events that caused the King Philip's War. Meanwhile, in 1623, the investors of the Plymouth Company in England, who had financed the new settlement in Massachusetts, grew concerned about the financial success of the Plymouth Colony, and sent an adventurer named John Oldham to keep them informed of happenings. Oldham played a major role in native relations as time passed. And also by coincidence, in 1623, my mother's original settling ancestor arrived in New England. Edward Hilton was a well-to-do member of the London Fishmongers Guild. He came with servants, cattle, and settlement tools to a place called Wokahamet, now Dover, New Hampshire, and set up a successful cod-drying operation, possibly using native labor. He soon acquired additional land near Elliott, Maine, through a deal with Tahanto, Sagamore of the Pentacook. By 1624, John Oldham had apparently grown unwelcome in Plymouth. He was surly, refused a night watch, and angered Miles Standish. Governor John Bradford intercepted letters back to England that Oldham had dictated disparaging the Plymouth leadership and demanding that non-Puritans should have a voice in all courts and elections if they came as shareholders. Oldham was put on trial for treason and was expelled from Plymouth with his family to Nantasket, where he set up a trading post with natives. In 1625, he survived a shipwreck while trading in Virginia, and this evidently led him to repent and make peace with the Plymouth Colony. In 1628, scattered old planters 
men who settled land but were not part of colonies, including both John Oldham and Edward Hilton, complained to Plymouth that Thomas Morton at Merrimount was selling muskets, powder, and shot to the Indians. In reality, Morton was attempting to lead a utopian community that treated natives as equal to colonists as long as they accepted Christian teachings. The colony was proving more financially successful than Plymouth in terms of growing crops and trading. Morton had insulted Puritan standards by introducing natives to traditional maypole dance and spring celebrations. Miles Standish was sent in June to stop this dangerous practice. He chopped down the maypole and arrested Morton. John Oldham was then paid by the old planters to escort Morton back to England to stand trial. While in England, Oldham schemed to obtain a grant from heirs of an old patent from King James for the land that he had long admired for trading, fishing, and planting. However, this happened to be a duplicate of a new grant given to the Mass Bay Company from King Charles. Holding a grant for what is now Charleston, Somerville, Cambridge, Arlington, Belmont, and Watertown, Oldham interviewed with the Mass Bay Company trying to negotiate a leadership deal with the company. Something happened to break off the deal, with the company finding Oldham altogether unfit to deal with. The company kept Oldham waiting for a response and rushed a surveyor over to set up structures and lay out a settlement plan for Charlestown, the center of Oldham's claim. Oldham, meanwhile, failed to find capital elsewhere and returned to Nantasket in the early spring of 1630. Roger Clapp's recounting of his May 1630 adventures with the Dorchester men, exchanging a great bass for biscuits with natives at Pequasset, is an honored tale in Watertown lore. What is not often noted is that it was John Oldham, the old planter from Nantasket, who rescued the stranded newcomers, shuttled them up the Quinobican River, and dialogued with the 300 natives camping there. He convinced them not to approach the fearful but armed English at night. The Dorchester men worked to build a structure at the landing place, but they were not allowed to settle there. On June 14, 1630, the Arabella, flagship of an 11-boat fleet, sailed into Salem Harbor. Among the upper class on board were Governor John Winthrop, Sir Richard Saltonstall and family, the poet Anne Bradstreet, and the Reverend George Phillips, all accompanied by their servants. Also on board was the signed charter from the Mass Bay Company, which stated the principal end of this plantation was to win and incite the natives of this country to the Christian faith. The colony's official seal depicted a sad native imploring the English to come over and help us. In a clear sign that native tribes wished to cooperate with the English, Winthrop notes that on June 16th, the Sagamore of Agawand, named Maskinomit, and one of his men came aboard the ship and stayed all day. In an effort to settle old conflicting land claims, one of Governor John Winthrop's first acts was to grant the old planters rights to land where their houses stood. John Oldham was granted the land in Watertown, where the Dorchester men had built a structure, likely because he had moved in. In July 1630, Sir Richard Saltonstall led a group up the Charles River to Pequasset and established the Saltonstall Plantation with his servants and cattle. With him was Reverend George Phillips, who was named as the settlement minister and together with 40 men signed a liberal church covenant. Saltonstall was appointed magistrate and justice of the peace. He is often called the founder of Watertown, even though he actually returned to England six months later. 
Also in July 1630, one of the first acts of the Mass Bay Court was to issue fines and then prison for anyone sharing guns with natives. In August 1630, Arbella fleet member John Underhill was hired to captain and train a militia with the primary duty to protect the settlement from natives, even though there had been no native attacks. He later proved to be highly efficient at deadly warfare against natives. In January 1631, Governor John Winthrop led a group to explore what would be the Waltham Territory. They renamed many of the natural features they saw for later recognition, including Beaver Brook, Masters Brook, named for John Master, the oldest member of the group, and Mount Feek for Robert Feek. Some of the Western Territory around what is now Hardy Pond was occupied by Massachusetts, led by Kachamakan, who was Chickatabit's brother. And on the family front, in early 1631, Edward Hilton was formally granted the Swampscott patent, giving him lands that contained the current towns of Dover, Durham, Madbury, Lee, Somersworth, Rawlingsford, Stratham, parts of Newington, and Greenland, New Hampshire. In March 1631, Sagamore John complained to the Watertown court that two wigwams had been burnt by Sir Saltonstall's servant. The court ordered Saltonstall to pay the Sagamore for his loss, which he did with seven yards of cloth. Saltonstall required, however, that his servant repay him fifty shillings sterling once his servitude had expired. Despite a generous land grant of over 580 acres, Saltonstall left the colony that same month and permanently returned to England leaving his servants, cattle, and two sons. There are countless examples of local Sockham and Sagamore trying to work cooperatively with the English through the court system. In April 1631, Sockham Sohage from the village of Pigua on the Connecticut River near Hartford visited Governor Winthrop, seeking to have some English settle on his land. At the time, his Wangunk tribe was in conflict with the Pequot tribe, who wanted control of the inland Dutch fur trade and the Wangunk were seeking colonial support. That same month, the Watertown militia was officially established. Men between the ages of 16 to 60 were required to serve in the militia to supply their own weapons. The training day began and ended with a sermon conducted by the minister, Rev. George Phillips. Training was serious drills as the Puritans felt threatened by surrounding native tribes. In May 1631, the court in Watertown voted that only approved church members could be named as freemen and be given the right to vote. Just prior to this, John Oldham, not a church member, was granted freeman status. Oldham is listed as one of the original founders of Watertown. In 1632, Edward Hilton first profited from sale of his land in Dover, when a group of Puritans from the Mass Bay Company informed him that they had a duplicate land claim. Hilton was eventually given land in Exeter, New Hampshire, where he built a farm that remains in the Hilton family today. In 1633, Sockham Chickatabit died from smallpox. The Massachusetts tribe today believes that smallpox may have been spread on blankets gifted by the English as a way to weaken the still powerful tribe. In September 1633, John Oldham traveled across the native-built Old Connecticut Path to visit Sockham Sohage and was treated kindly. He returned with hemp, beaver, and black lead. That same year, the Wangunk tribe was greatly weakened by a smallpox outbreak, as were the nearby Pequot tribes. In 1634, with the Watertown residents struggling to feed themselves, 
Oldham traveled by ship to trade with the Narragansett of Rhode Island and returned with 500 bushels of corn. In May 1634, after the freemen of Watertown had successfully argued for no taxation without voting representation in the general court, John Oldham was sent as one of three representatives for Watertown to the first general court of delegates. In the same year, Oldham is granted 500 acres on the north side of the Charles, including Mount Feek, likely to extinguish his original land claim. John Oldham is currently honored as the first landowner in Waltham. In September 1634, Oldham led a party of eight men down the native trails to the wide-stretching lowlands and the gentle ridge that he had visited the year before, the place called Pequog. They built a few huts and later a meeting house and renamed the place New Watertown, now Wethersfield, Connecticut. In 1635, Oldham led another group of 20 settlers to this new settlement including a young minister named John Sherman, who had preached a few sermons for Reverend George Philip. Sherman was named the magistrate at New Watertown. In 1636, the majority of what is now Waltham was divided into 120 plots of varying sizes and was given to the 120 church member freemen in what was called the Great Dividends, land grant. This caused great conflict between freemen and non-church members. In July 1636, John Oldham earned one final memorial monument on Block Island as his bloodied body was found on his ship, killed by the Manassas Narragansett. It appears that Oldham was deemed traitorous for trading both with the Pequots and the Narragansett, who were enemies in an economic power struggle over English and Dutch trade. In August, troops that included Watertown militia members headed to Block Island, where they burned seven villages, killed 14 Manassas, all the dogs, and captured several children. Then they decided to attack the Pequot in Connecticut, who were not involved in Oldham's death, and they burned a Pequot village along the Pequot River. In September, the Pequots retaliated by attacking a fort in Old Saybrook and killed a handful of villagers in various skirmishes. In April 1637, the residents of Wethersfield evicted the resident Wangunk tribe, who fled to the Pequots. The Pequot attacked the town, killed nine villagers, and captured three women. Among the settlers was Magistrate John Sherman. Connecticut declared war on the Pequots, and Mr. Sherman is listed on the war order. In May 1637, Captain John Underhill along with Narragansett and Mohegan allies, led an attack on a Pequot fort in Mystic, Connecticut. Ultimately, they burned the fortress village, trapping all the Pequot inside, killing over 400 men and women. Following various encounters, Underhill claimed that the English kill more than 400 more as they retreat to ships. By August 1637, after numerous battles with native village burnings and the death of hundreds by battle or execution, the Pequot Sacum Secaucus was finally captured and killed. Some Pequot women and children were given as slaves to the Narragansett and the Mohegans. Others were enslaved in the West Indies, where today on St. David's Island in Bermuda, most of the residents claim Pequot heritage. As it happens, in November 1637, my original Tappan ancestor arrived to help settle Newbury, Massachusetts. 
Abraham Toppin is documented to have made numerous profitable trading trips to Barbados as part of the Triangle Trade Route. The Tappan family built numerous houses in Newburyport. By July of 1638, all remaining Waltham land was divided up into much smaller lots and granted to non-church members in what was called the In Lieu of Township Grant. In September 1638, my father's maternal ancestor, Robert Carver, was granted 20 acres to help expand Plymouth Colony into now Marshfield, Massachusetts. And that same month, the Treaty of Hartford was signed to officially end the Pequot War. The treaty commanded that surviving Pequots be dispersed among the Mohegan and Narragansett, no longer to be called Pequot and never be allowed to return to their former territory. It was signed by Mohegan Sacum Uncas and Narragansett Sacum Myantanomo. These were the only two native names that I remember learning in my third grade history lessons growing up in Norwich, Connecticut, which lies along the Thames River. In 1639, Harvard College entered agreement with the Pawtucket woman leader called Squaw Sockham to settle the town of Cambridge. She insisted that her own village on the Mystic River and her community's subsistence rights on the Headwaters Pond be respected. Nani Peshimit and Squaw Sockham. Nani Peshimit was the supreme Sockham of the North Shore before and during the plagues ruling over a larger area than any other. Many Sockums paid tribute to Nani Peshimit, including some Nipmuc. It wasn't until the plagues killed most of his people in the Abenaki with the help of French muskets that Nani Peshimit fell, finally fell to the Abenaki. He was killed in 1619. Nani Peshimit's wife, Squaw Sockum, and her three sons, Mona Hanakuam, Mona Motowampiti, and Winupokin, took over his, all his territory. Squaw Sockum, is a title, not a name, meaning woman leader. There are many reasons why scholars say Squaw Sockham kept her name a secret. The true reason is simple. She didn't want any European to know her name. Life for Squaw Sockham after her husband was killed must have been extremely difficult. With the Abenaki continuously attacking her territory, she saw the English as a powerful ally. But at what cost? Now, Squaw Sockham, um, she was very good at negotiation with the English. She deeded over uh, quite a bit of land, as her sons did. But it was good to have the English here because the Abenaki were continually raiding. So the feud between the Massachusetts and the Abenaki must have been severe because they weren't even satisfied with Nani Peshimit's death. With the onset of the English settlers coming in the early to middle 1620s, you can see exactly what happened to the Massachusetts. From once numerous and prosperous tribe, our territory was being invaded from all sides. It seems like Captain John Smith was correct. The country of the Massachusetts was indeed the paradise of all these parts. Now, like you see with this map, I mean, this is all the same time period while well, this was happening. Um, you like Abenaki from the north and Mohawk from the south, and then you had the English coming from the east. Uh, the Massachusetts had nowhere to go. We had to stay. Um, during this time period, when the English started settling, there were many natives who didn't like the Massachusetts because we made friends of the English, um, with a few exceptions of disputes that happened from here and here, here and there. But primarily, our Sockums always worked with the English, um, like they had some foresight that the English were going to keep coming. A major figure on the trail of local natives was the Reverend John Elliott of Roxbury, early prosecutor of Anne Hutchinson, who found funding through the Mass Bay Charter to convert natives to Christianity. He began by learning Algonquin in 1637 from Kokono, a Pequot slave living in Dorchester, who had been captured during the war. 
he translated some scripture into Algonquin and in 1646 had success preaching to the native Nipmuc at Nonantum under Sakam Wabin, who felt connection to the biblical stories. By 1651, Wabin's group had been pushed west out of Newton and felt the English could provide a safe village at Natick. This would be the first of 14 Christian Indian praying towns associated with Eliot. John Eliot was a preacher who established many praying towns in Massachusetts, the first being Natick, the second being Ponca Park. Eliot, with the help of his Massachusetts interpreter, successfully translated the English Bible, the Geneva Bible, into the Massachusetts language. The Eliot Bible became the first Bible printed in the New World. Eliot created these praying towns in hopes of saving the indigenous from certain extinction. Eliot knew, with the thousands of Europeans arriving each year, the Massachusetts and surrounding tribes would either be converted to Christianity or be exterminated by the strict English ideals. Now, for us at this time period, um, we really caught, you know, the worst of both worlds. We had um, neighboring tribes raiding us, um, even more so now, because now we were living in praying towns. And then you had the English colonists who wanted us exterminated because we were filthy savages. And this is the way we were viewed. Uh, you know, growing up learning about John Eliot, you know, I was kind of like, can't stand that guy, man. Forget John Elliot, right? But learning about him, I mean, if it wasn't for John Elliot and me and my mother, we wouldn't be here. So these praying towns actually saved our lives. Um, and it gave us our language because we had no written language. So Elliot wrote our language down. So that's awesome that now we have our language. John Elliot's praying towns were set up with strict Puritan rules of behavior designed to eliminate native traditions. English clothes were worn, English homes were built, and English customs were introduced. In Natick, Sakam Wabin turned over a young John Sassaman to Eliot for education at his Roxbury Latin Prep School. Sassaman also attended Harvard College and became a key translator both for Eliot's Bible project and many native land sale deeds, indicating that he may have often supported the English in these exchanges. Harvard created an Indian college specifically designed to train native ministers to preach Christianity to natives and to act as translators. But these villages were all established in places that felt sacred to the natives, like this spot in Natick, where Christianized Nipmunk gathered in 1651, and they lived with some security over 20 years. The second town established was with the Massachusetts tribe at Punkapog in the Blue Hills. The Nipmuc Christians near Concord gathered at the long, sacred Neshoba Hill and Nagog Pond near Littleton. Further west, Nipmunk gathered at Magunko or Magunkaquag, where Ashland now stands. Even further west, Nipmunk were granted 6,000 acres near modern Marlborough at Okamokamesset. In 1654, a group of Nipmunk formed a Christian village by the long-inhabited pond named Machog near the Nipmuc River, renamed Blackstone after a settler. In modern Grafton, the Nipmuc were granted 7,500 acres for the village of Hasamaneset. One resident named Warus was called James the Printer and was the major contributor to the production of Eliot's Algonquin English up Biblum, which was published in 1633. The late 1630s was a time of continuing settlement expansion by the English. In 1665, my direct ancestor Isaac Tappan, son of Abraham, moved with his brother Abraham as original settlers to Woodbridge, New Jersey. 
This was the ancestral homeland of the Algonquin-speaking Lene Lenape people, which translates as the original people, but who the English called the Delaware. This English expansion would lead over time to continued forced migrations west for the Lenape through New York, Ohio, the Indian Territory, renamed Indiana, and even further west to Oklahoma. In 1669, to the north, Christianized Penacook gathered at the village of Wameset on the Merrimack River, near modern Tewksbury. As western expansion continued into the 1670s, six more praying towns were established, just as the settlers moved west along the old Connecticut path. These Nipmuc villages were at Chabunagagamug, or Webster Lake, near Dudley, Watong Pond, near Sutton, Pakachog at Lake Kusigamund, near Worcester, and three villages along the Quinnebog River in Connecticut, Wabakwasset near present-day Woodstock, Quinnetesset near Pomford, Connecticut, and Menexit near Thompson. But John Eliot's multiple-decade effort to protect natives through Christian assimilation came to a crashing end in the year 1675, when John Sesamon's frozen body was found drowned in the Aswampsit Pond in January. Sesamon had served as a translator, scribe, and legal representative for Massasoit's Wampanoag son, Metacom, who was also called King Philip. Metacom deeded land for more than three settler towns, but still was mistrusted and was forced to sign treaties of allegiance to King Charles II in both 1662 and 1671. As years passed, English land demands continued, and the long cooperative Metacom grew to feel that the only hope for native sovereignty was through resistance. John Sassamon reported to Plymouth that Metacom hoped to organize other tribes against the English. After his body was found, whether accidentally drowned or murdered, the English court quickly convicted and executed three Wampanoag supporters of King Philip for assassinating Sassamon. This act in June 1675 was the tipping point that set into motion bloody attacks and counterattacks between King Philip and his Wampanoag, Narragansett, Nipmuc, and Pocumptic allies against the English militia across settlement towns. And so it was in October 1675. The Massachusetts Council ordered that all the peaceful Christian Indians from the praying villages be confined in a concentration camp on Deer Island. It was the ultimate betrayal for those natives who had believed that the Puritans would protect them through Christianity. Though many escaped to the woods and joined other tribes, close to a thousand men, women, and children from villages along the Connecticut path were rounded up, shackled, and carted to to Watertown where they were shipped to Deer Island and forced to endure the winter with minimal resources. More than half did not survive the harsh conditions. After much more continued violence, Metacom was killed in August of 1676. His body mutilated and hung from trees. But the war didn't end with the death of Philip. The rage of war spread to Maine and New Hampshire, where the Abenaki attacked some of the towns where colonial traders had cheated them. Random raids, scalping of Indians, and skirmishes continued in northern New England until a treaty was signed at Casco Bay in April of 1678. The King Philip's War resulted in the death of 600 colonists and the destruction of 12 settlements. It halted the fur trade economy and English expansion for 20 years. The native population of Massachusetts suffered at least a 60% loss from death, disease, and enslavement. Throughout all the years of the King Philip's War, the minister at First Parish Watertown 
was the Reverend John Sherman, who had witnessed the native attack during the Pequot War in Wethersfield. Though the war never came to Watertown, the Watertown militia played a major role in many of the battles. Sadly, the end of the King Philip's War did not bring the end of colonial native violence. Between the years 1688 and 1699, the King William's War brought extreme violence to both the North, with Abenaki and French fighting English, and to the West, with Iroquois and French fighting the English, mostly over control of the lucrative fur trade and long-growing resentments. In the Mass Bay Colony, hostility towards natives morphed into superstitious hysteria in 1692, when a slave of the Reverend Samuel Paris in Salem, an indigenous woman likely from South America via Barbados, named Tichuba, and her native husband were the first accused of witchcraft. Before the hysteria ended, over 150 people were accused and tortured in the famous witch trials. The Reverend Henry Gibbs, first parish of Watertown minister at the time, attended the trials as a witness in May of 1692 and was less than condemning. He walked away vowing only to be a better person. While Gibbs was minister, the Queen Anne's War spilled into the colonies from European trade wars, pushing more brutality across the colonies between 1702 and 1713. English colonists with Mohawk fought the French and Abenaki forces throughout Newfoundland and New England, while English also fought with Spanish and Apalachee from the Carolinas to Florida. Among the agreements that ended the war was that England was given exclusive rights to supply Spain's American colonies with black slaves at the rate of 4800 a year for 30 years. I can find no saved record of Gibbs' views on natives or slavery. Upon his death in 1723, Reverend Gibbs passed to the first parish endowment seven acres of land, and his silver bowl. While Henry Gibbs was still minister in Watertown, the people living in the distant Waltham territory demanded a separation from Watertown and established their own church in 1696. It was not until 1723 that they settled their first minister, the Reverend Wareham Williams. When Wareham was four years old, he lived in Deerfield during an infamous Queen Anne's War attack. His two younger siblings were killed in the attack by French and Abenaki troops. He was captured with his family and led on a 200-mile freezing walk to Canada, witnessed his mother's death, and was held captive for over two years. Oddly, this fact is not mentioned in Wareham's biographies, but the story is brashly told by his brother Stephen and his father, the Reverend John Williams, I could find no recorded history of Wareham Williams' views toward natives, but I did find that in 1730 he baptized the child of two black slaves living in Waltham. The historical trail of native ties to Watertown, Waltham, and Connecticut runs dry in the years leading up to the American Revolution. It is interesting to note that the minister for First Parish Watertown through much of the Revolution was Reverend Richard Roswell Elliott, the great-great-grandson of Reverend John Elliott. It is also telling to hear the view of natives from the Reverend Converse Francis, who followed Elliott at First Parish Watertown in 1819. It seems the entirety of indigenous culture, cultivation, communities, and civility had been erased. When New England was settled, the Puritans had for many years been growing in numbers and strength. But the hope of religious liberty was so far crushed that many of them turned their eyes and fixed them on this western region, then lying a mere wilderness under the shade of deep forests, and trodden by no human foot, 
but that of the savage. Reverend Converse Francis, History of Watertown, 1830. By the early decades of the 1800s, the trail of Eastern Native experience has largely turned westward, as tribe after tribe are pushed further away from their ancestral homelands. The Lene Lenape largely end up in the Indian Territory, pushed west from New Jersey, as do all three mentioned branches of my family, where there is a convergence of families in Indiana. The Carvers married Quakers, who had been among the first white settlers to migrate west and settle among the natives. They acquired farming land near Sockham Anderson's village in Indiana as the Lenape were pushed further west to Oklahoma starting in 1812. There is visual evidence that my father's maternal great-great-grandmother may have been an assimilated Lenape. The Tappans married carvers and settled on farmland sold by the U.S. government in Indiana in 1835, where my father found many arrowheads while working in the fields as a boy. My mother's Hilton ancestor, Elbridge, from Massachusetts, spent time in Indiana during the Civil War. He married Rachel, also from an Indiana Quaker settler family, who often listed her mother as unknown, but passed on an oral history that her mother was part Cherokee. Along a genealogical trail, I have found that my mother's great-great-great-great-grandfather is likely a noted Cherokee Sakum Ohlone Black Fox, who was forced to sign the Halston Treaty in 1792, which placed the Cherokee in Tennessee under protection of the U.S. government. This treaty lasted less than a decade before the Cherokee were forced to leave their lands, illegally settled by white families. I share these links between my family and native tribes to illustrate the point that for many natives, assimilation into white families, either forced or by choice, was likely a sad path to survival, perhaps given no other options, one that guaranteed a complete loss of ancestral family ties, culture, and identity. There is no question that every branch of my family tree benefited greatly from the acquisition of land and the wealth that this generates. As demonstrated by settler John Oldham, land equals power. All settler families of Waltham, Watertown, and Connecticut have generationally held the keys to community power. Even low-income Indiana farmers during the Great Depression had the sustenance of the land to support them. The first parish of Watertown continues to prosper largely due to an endowment passed on by landowners. Harvard University now has the largest endowment of every academic institution and owns an ever-growing 5,000 acres of land throughout Massachusetts. I have personally visited two former native villages in Ashland and Concord just this summer, both acquired by Harvard through dubious land deals. And by contrast, the Hassamanesco Nipmuc Nation in Massachusetts holds tightly to a mere four-acre reservation site in Grafton, Massachusetts. Mother Earth cannot be owned. The people were the caretaker, the steward for Mother Earth, seeking harmony for what they needed and what was good for their mother. And the people were called the Nipmuc, the freshwater people. Well, I was Nipmuc before being Nipmuc was cool. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't, definitely was not a cool thing. And all the kids in the neighborhood used to gather on the bulkhead at our house in Winsocket 
and listen to, because they all listened to my grandmother's stories. All their friends in the neighborhood came over because she, you know, she'd just sit there and tell them stories for hours and hours. We love this part of, of the world of New England, Turtle Island, and the knowledge that there were people who would have the power to just pack us all up and send us out west someplace was a, a big danger hanging over our head, a very real danger, and it was a very real possibility. And at this time frame, your ceremonies, your language, what happened to them? Basically, in today's terms, it would be called underground. And in large part, I think we probably all agree, it was basically the Narragansetts who helped to preserve that because they had, they did retain a fairly large land base compared to the inland peoples. And they maintained continuity of not only the spiritual ceremonial activities, but uh, they were free to speak the language where if you survived by managing to somehow um, deal with the situation of, of living in the, in the white towns, as they called them, it was against the law to speak the Indian languages. So the only way to maintain uh, contact with your identity was to have these almost like clandestine gatherings where it was okay to be yourself. There was kind of an ethnic cleansing with a pen going on. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, if you did not have white skin, you were considered black. And a lot of times, I mean, even today, you go into the town halls and you see where people have actually written over the records mm -hmm. yeah. where it was put in that they were Indian and someone went in and wrote black over it. And you can actually see in censuses from time to time where they may have been Indian in the first three censuses and then the last six of their life they're considered black. But you not also notice something else on those censuses that they were together here, and they're still together here. It hasn't mattered what people have decided to do, you know, how they wanted to do what they wanted to do. We've stuck together. Hello, my name is Paula Peters. My traditional name is Sonkwaben, and I am from the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. I have the privilege to speak on this occasion from my ancestral homeland, the land where Wampanoag emerged from the roots of the great white pine more than 12,000 years ago. As much as this land has changed and developed, I cling to the small bits of it that are left to me like the tuft of green weed that fights its way through a crack in a concrete sidewalk, drinking seeped rainwater and reaching for the sun it was not, as William Bradford described, a vast and unpeopled country that he said was fruitful and fit for habitation, being devoid of all civil inhabitants where there are only savage and brutish men. My ancestors were not brutish or savage. They understood the interplanetary significance of the sun and moon to Mother Earth in establishing a cycle of seasons for growing harvesting, hunting, and preparation. They were people who managed their presence on earth to be in balance with nature, sustaining themselves without starving the living world around them. Their spirituality centered on the circle of life and their place within it. It was a way of life and worship those pilgrims sought to eradicate from the moment they arrived. In establishing a colony, there are those who make a new life for themselves and there are those who are colonized. Colonization brought us expanded horizons. Colonization brought us novelties, glass beads, a kettle and a hoe. Colonization took advantage of our kindness. Colonization brought us disease. Colonization brought us firearms and alcohol. Colonization took our land. Colonization buried our children in unmarked graves. 
Today, there are as many as 5,000 Wampanoag who are part of two federally acknowledged tribes and several small bands living in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We are both contemporary and cultural, and many of us continue to practice our traditions in the ways of our ancestors. Today, I am grateful for this opportunity to tell you that I do not hold you accountable for the actions of your ancestors. I hold you responsible for the future. Ketabatanamu. To the left is our tribal sail. We have taken the Massachusetts state sail back. The drawing of the native in the center has always been known to be an Algonquin Indian. Our research has shown that, in fact, it was a Massachusetts warrior. On the state seal, the arrow in his hand is pointed down to show we submit. We have pointed the arrow up to show we now stand strong. Today, we are more publicly active than we have been over the last century. We speak at schools, colleges, universities, and events. We fight for our land. We fight for land preservation, and most of the time, going against businesses with deep pockets. We stand up for the equality for all the races. We march, sing, and pray for justice. We have reinvented ourselves. Where there was once sadness and despair, there is now hope and happiness. And that's my lovely mother on the right there. Um, that was uh, Columbus Day. And that was a march to Harvard. Um, that's not just all us there. There's, there's other people there, too. I believe there's Navajo, there's some um, Penobscot, um, even Abenaki. Yeah, Abenaki, yeah. But they're cool now. Um, <laughs> and here are some of our young. Um, we're cleaning some of our tribal land. Um, we always like to keep them involved, um, especially to learn to honor and, and respect the land, take care of it. Because when we're gone, they have to be there to step up to take care of the land. Uh, because if people aren't there to take care of the land, we all know what will happen. This is our tribal council um, with our Sockum. Um, he's to the right. That's our, um, our main Sockum. This is Gil. And this is our young ones. Um, it's actually my daughter. I had to run there. Um, she, um, she's going to be a leader one day for sure. 